Hello everybody, my name is Dimitris Karakostas, I am a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh and this is a joint work with Agilus Kayas and Nikos Karagiannidis from OHK. So in our paper we look into, as the title suggests, efficient state management in distributed ledgers. And first of all, let's start with state. So in distributed ledgers, or rather blockchain-based ledgers that we look into, uh, we have three types of shared state. First, we have the public ledger itself. So this is an ordered list of published transactions which are grouped together in uh, in interconnected blocks. The second is the mempool, which is a set of unpublished transactions which the miners uh, validate before uh, putting into blocks and uh, extending uh, the, state, the public ledger. And finally, we have the active state. So this is the aggregate state uh, which uh, arises from uh, the history of the uh, um, of the ledger. So in Bitcoin, that would be the UTXO set, and in Ethereum, it would be the global state. So why do we care about efficient management of this uh, third type uh, of state? So the first uh, answer is because of attacks. There have been some attacks which target this type of state and try to uh, denial of service uh, the whole system. So both in Ethereum and in Bitcoin, there have been these floods, uh, flood attacks which try to stress the networks. But even if we don't have attacks, we have the actual problem of uh, resource usage. So in order to maintain a shared state across hundreds of it, or even thousands of participants, we require a lot of uh, resources to be put to be input. So for example, that would be uh, CPU usage, memory, disk storage, uh, etc. So a transaction which actually increases the shared state, for example, in Bitcoin transaction that creates more outputs than the inputs that it consumes, would actually require more resources. And if uh, more transactions are like that, uh, tra if transactions typically increase the state, then as the system scales, we would end up in a, in a high requirement of resources, which might even be unmaintainable. So the question that we try to answer in this work is how we can produce incentive compatible, but also state efficient transactions. Let's see an overview of the presentation. So in this presentation, first, I'm going to describe the, the model that we use for the UTXO ledger. Uh, and this comprises of the algebra and the operators that we uh, use to describe this ledger. Then I'm going to go over the optimization problem uh, for transaction efficiency and the framework that we create to try to solve this problem. And finally, I'm going to go over how to make uh, uh, efficient transactions incentive compatible. That is how to incentivize users via fees in order to create efficient transactions rather than transactions that increase uh, the state of the ledger. So first of all, the model. And uh, our model is a standard uh, first order algebra based uh, model in a top-down approach. So first, we describe the ledger, which is the list of transactions. Each transaction consists of uh, various objects, like its inputs, the inputs that it consumes, the outputs that it produces, the value of the transaction, that is the value that is transferred between the participants. Then its UTXO is, it consists of an address and the value that the address owns for the UTXO. The input is the index, that is the number of the UTXO in the whole uh, list of UTXOs, which is the shared state. And uh, yeah, finally, the state is the set of all inputs. And finally, we have a cost uh, function, which uh, takes a transaction and a ledger state and outputs a real number. And uh, as a consequence, it's transaction which moves uh, the system from one state to another also comes at a cost. And this is the cost of the final state of the system minus the cost of the initial state before the transaction is applied. So this is the, the basic uh, model. And uh, for now, cost is uh, generic, 
but uh, in our work, in our uh, uh, examples and our analysis, we assume that cost is uh, the size of the state in bytes. Uh, but you could also imagine other types of costs, like the number of cycles that are needed to compute the state. So what is the problem we try to solve? Uh, first, we assume that M parties try to perform, or, or rather want to perform, N payments. The solution space of the problem is uh, all these equivalent transactions that achieve, uh, achieve the same goal, that is, transferring uh, value across the N, M parties according to the N payments, uh, but these transactions end up or uh, produce a different ledger state. And some ledger states might be more efficient, that is, might be smaller than other states. So the optimization problem is how to find this transaction uh, among all these equivalent transactions that minimizes the state cost. Uh, with respect to a cost model like I described. So how do we solve this problem? We solve it by devising a framework which is uh, based around four uh, phases. And uh, this uh, framework is inspired by optimization techniques for database queries. So the four phases, which I'm going to explain in more detail later, are rules, uh, which are heuristics, practically, uh, and then there are some cost-based decisions like algebraic transformations, the implementations of uh, the sub-routines uh, of uh, that are used by uh, participants and uh, structures, and finally uh, the a, a planning and uh, an actual searching of the entire space to find or rather approximate the optimal solution according to our cost model. So let's go to phase one. So phase one consists of uh, various rules that are heuristic based and depending on the system or the, the, the construction of the ledger uh, are ad, uh, ad hoc uh, solutions that uh, are uh, uh, flat across all transactions. So uh, in all cases, a, a heuristic uh, that uh, is part of these rules will end up in a better or more efficient transaction. For example, uh, one such heuristic is to produce a single output per address per transaction. Or another heuristic would be to consume as many inputs as you can, that is to reduce the state as much as you can. And a final interesting uh, rule that we have an example here is uh, to reorder the creation of transactions according to the last payer rule. And here we have an example where four participants, Alice, Bob, Charlie and Eve, try to uh, uh, perform some transactions. And uh, depending on the ordering of the transactions, we might end up in a different, uh, we will end up in a different state and the state might have different costs. So here, if we perform uh, the transactions in the first order, one, two, three, four, then the state, uh, the the cost would be nine because we would have even if we follow the heuristic rules like consuming as many inputs as you can, you necessarily end up with uh, this cost because uh, of who pays, uh, whom, uh, and uh, which transaction is performed first. If we reorder the transactions, then we could actually minimize the the state, the cost of the state by two. The second phase is uh, algebraic transformations. Uh, and uh, here we have an example of such a transformation, which uh, we call the 241 transformation. And the intuition behind this transformation is that we want to uh, use two transactions instead of, instead of one in order to consume more inputs. So, uh, if we assume no fee constraints for now, then uh, uh, it might make sense to, for example, for Alice to give Bob more money uh, than she can, and then Bob to give back a larger number of change in order to, for Bob to actually also consume some of the uh, inputs or yeah, uh, GTXOs that Bob has. So if we went, 
for a single transaction approach, for example, Alice would give a sing uh, would consume one uh, input and would produce one output. If we go for the two for one transformation, then Alice could give to Bob a could, could consume more inputs in order to give Bob more money, and then Bob would consume some of its inputs to actually give to Alice back the the remaining change, and that could end up in a smaller state. And next, we'll see actually an example of where this uh, happens. The third phase is the actual implementation of the methods and the structures that are used by the participants, by the nodes, to, uh, to construct the transaction. And as an example, one such uh, subroutine is the input selection algorithm. So here, let's see an example of how input selection or the implementation of the input selection algorithm could uh, change the uh, state of the system and how the two-for-one transformation could actually be used to reduce uh, the state. So we have an example where Alice has these uh, six UTXOs, these six inputs, and Bob has these five inputs. And Alice wants to give Bob five coins. So the first approach would be to simply, uh, for Alice to consume this uh, UTXO of uh, five coins, and uh, to create a new UTXO for Bob, that is for five coins. Now, this uh, approach would keep the cost of the state the same because we have uh, 11 inputs before and after the uh, transaction. Another approach would be to actually uh, consume, uh, for Alice to consume this input of 50 coins and give Bob five, that is create a UTXO for five coins that is owned by Bob, and also create a UTXO for 45 coins, which is owned by Alice. This is the change, uh, practically. And uh, this approach would actually increase the state because uh, now Alice would have six UTXOs, but also Bob would have six UTXOs, and that would uh, uh, mean a cost of 11. And here, uh, the cost is actually the number of UTXOs in the state. Uh, and if we assume that uh, each UTXO has a fixed size, then this is equivalent to uh, the, the size of the state in bytes. So how could we do uh, something better? Well, we could uh, apply the two-for-one transformation and change the way that uh, Alice uh, uh, consumes inputs. So, for example, Alice could consume a larger number of uh, inputs uh, and uh, uh, give Bob more than five coins. And then Bob could give back these uh, 12 co uh, coins that it has in order to balance the transaction. So, in the end, we could end up with a situation where Alice has two outputs and uh, Bob actually has one output. So, in that case, um, uh, the cost of the entire uh, state would be three, which is obviously much, much better than uh, either of the two previous uh, options. So now that we have the first three phases, we have a fourth phase, which is uh, the, the searching of the entire space. And uh, obviously, it doesn't make sense to brute force and search everything because, well, if we did that, then... Uh, uh, th this would suffice. I mean, we wouldn't need the first three phases. So searching here is actually uh, uh, done around some optimization cost-based metrics and uh, also uh, around some limits. So for example, if we take into account fees, we would want to search the space of these optimal solutions that are produced uh, from the previous three phases uh, in a way that uh, limits the fees that the user has to pay. So when we group them all together, let's first revisit the optimization problem under uh, this uh, new light, uh, this framework that we devised. So again, we have end payments between M parties and a search space S of uh, equivalent uh, transaction plans. And each plan is uh, practically an ordered uh, set or a list of transactions. 
And the problem is to find the optimal plan uh, which minimizes the cost of the uh, state. So after each of these uh, transactions in the plan is performed, this, the cost of the state is as small as possible. And how do we solve this problem using our framework? Where we propose a three-step dynamic programming algorithm. So in the first step, uh, we take uh, the entire search space and we apply our heuristics, our uh, rules, and we also uh, use the best uh, implementation of input selection, which is uh, the, an exhaustive uh, cost-based search, in order to produce uh, the best individual uh, transaction for each payment that needs to be performed. So for each uh, of the end payments, we output the optimal plan uh, uh, using steps one and two. And then uh, for step three, we prune the search space of these uh, 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 transactions that are produced from the first two two steps uh, using the last payer heuristic rule. And uh, this uh, algorithm actually approximates uh, the optimal solution for this optimization problem. So now that we have the, well, we have our algorithm, we have our framework, we have uh, approximated the optimal solution, how do we uh, incentivize users to actually use this uh, solution? And here comes uh, state efficient fees. So the goal uh, of uh, uh, state efficient fees is to try to persuade users to manage state efficiently, that is to create the uh, most uh, efficient transactions. And if we assume that the users are rational, that is if we assume that the users try to minimize the fees that they pay, then if the fees uh, are state efficient, they will uh, result in a system that is optimal, but uh, uh, whose uh, cost is uh, uh, minimal. So what is state efficiency? And state efficiency is uh, a pretty simple uh, property that uh, transaction fees should uh, have. And uh, what it uh, describes is that the cost of the transaction should be reflected on the fees uh, of the transaction. So if a transaction incurs more cost to the state, and again, cost is, for example, the size of the state or the computation cycles, then the fees, which is the number of coins that the user should pay to the system maintainers, to the miners, should actually be more. And this is what this uh, uh, equation describes. And uh, we also have this notion of narrow state efficiency, which is the same as state efficiency, but across equivalent transactions. So if we assumed fixed uh, outputs uh, or uh, a fixed uh, um, uh, uh, payment uh, type, then narrow state efficiency uh, describes uh, uh, how fees should behave uh, for transactions that uh, implement these payments. And uh, the interesting part is how to actually implement state efficient fees. And we look into Bitcoin. So Bitcoin right now uh, uses these fees where uh, the fees are depend only on the size of the transaction. And uh, the score of each transaction, according to which typically miners uh, order transactions and find out which transactions should be put first in a block, is this fee per byte. So it's the fees that the transaction pays divide, uh, divided by the size of the transaction. So what we propose is instead of only taking into account the fees or the size, uh, we should also take into account the number of UTXOs or, well, the cost of the transaction. And uh, this cost should also come at a fee. And now the score would be uh, the fees of the transaction uh, reduced by the cost of this fixed cost uh, per uh, UTXO, this uh, cost of the transaction. And then what remains of the fees is divided by the uh, size of the transaction in order to find the score. 
So the intuition here is that actually a, a user uh, that creates a UTXO or a user that increases the state would pay an extra fee and the user that consumes the input and decreases the state and makes it more efficient would get reimbursed for it. So if we assume that uh, the fees per UTXO are, or this, uh, this cost-based fee is larger than the fees that depend on the size of the transaction, then the fee function is efficient. And uh, the UTXO reimbursement is actually large enough to cover for the increased fees that come with, well, consuming more inputs and uh, increasing the size of the transaction in bytes. And uh, the way we can apply this in Bitcoin is, uh, well, first of all, we can do this with, uh, without even a fork, where the miners and the users simply ad adopt this uh, new fee function, and the fee per UTXO could be uh, uh, a, a market-based uh, uh, evaluation as it is right now. And uh, another approach could be to do a soft fork, where the actual transaction's validity depends on the correct fee definition. So a transaction is valid only if it actually defines a high enough uh, number of, uh, of uh, fees to cover the, the increase in costs. So in conclusion, our work has looked into how to uh, efficiently manage state. And the reason we are interested in that is because inefficient state management could uh, lead to poor performance, that is to an, an ever-increasing uh, global state which might end up being unmaintainable or even uh, result in denial of service attacks. The way that we go about uh, tackling this problem is by framing it as a, an optimization problem, a transaction optimization problem, which takes into account uh, efficiency. And to solve this problem, we have devised a four-stage framework, uh, which is inspired by standard techniques of query optimizations. And uh, finally, we describe the algorithm that uh, uses this, uh, this framework and the phases of this framework to approximate the optimal solution for this uh, transaction optimization problem. And in order to actually incentivize users to use our framework and to use state-efficient transactions, we describe uh, how fees, transaction fees, should reflect the cost of the transaction. And uh, we come up with the state efficiency property of uh, fee functions. And we describe how state efficiency could actually be implemented today in Bitcoin in order to make it more uh, state efficient. Thank you.